Thank you very much for that introduction, Dr. Chasen. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're very excited to uh, share our research today on the development, growth, and updates uh, of our survivorship clinic here at William Oster Health System. So you might remember actually our presentation uh, a few years back. So today we're happy to bring you to the progress that we've made since. So the goal of our presentation today is to demonstrate the structure of our clinic. So specifically its philosophy, its model, how interdisciplinary team members all have a role in the clinic. I will also be discussing the common symptoms that patients attending the clinic experience. And finally, we'll also be demonstrating how the program has impacted patients, specifically their distress, and as well as the sustainability of the clinic moving forward. So to begin this presentation, I really just want to emphasize what the goals of cancer survivorship are. And I, really, I think a lot can be taken from the word itself, survivorship. And this word really refers to the condition of being a survivor. And so therefore, a survivorship clinic should set its goals on helping the survivor, and not just the illness. And so that's why we say a person's cancer journey doesn't just end at treatment. Being a survivor comes with its set of unique challenges uh, and needs that must be addressed, some of which include physical, psychosocial, and financial concerns. So it's important for us then to recognize the challenges of being a survivor from a holistic point of view. And so understanding the best we can, the burden that they carry, ultimately allowing us to take the necessary actions to show survivors that they are not alone. And really as much as you know, we as clinicians or researchers think or believe are the goals of cancer survivorship, I just want to highlight the importance of listening to the voices of survivors and other stakeholders themselves. And I really think an article from last year, which does this quite well, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the author, the paper from Dr. Urquhart and uh, colleagues. So I believe they actually presented to the consortium some time back on their work. So they essentially conducted this qualitative study uh, using interviews with stakeholders. And these stakeholders include survivors, family or friend, caregivers, oncology providers, primary care providers, and as well as uh, cancer system decision or policymakers across Canada. And the objective was to learn about their opinions on the most important outcomes uh, to access in survivorship research. And so in total, about 44 participants were recruited into the study and just over 40% of participants were survivors or family uh, from friend caregivers. So as you can see here, uh, what was found was that the stakeholders identify the most important outcomes. Uh, there's 13, outcomes and you can categorize them into five general categories and on the screen you can see psychosocial, physical, economic, informational and patterns and quality of care. So I won't go through all 13 outcomes but you can see them on the screen. The core message you can see from this list is the multifaceted issues that survivors face. So that speaks to us then that any approach to cancer survivorship should be an interdisciplinary one. And so it's with these set of unique patient challenges um, that led to the creation of the William Oster Survivorship Clinic. And it was open in the February of 2017, and that was initially at uh, Brampton Pacific Hospital, but it's since then also expanded to Etobicoke General Hospital. And uh, so it was the first fully comprehensive cancer survivorship clinic in the uh, greater Toronto area. And it's really just grown in size since inception. And of course, we have much data to share with you on that in the uh, coming slides. So very briefly, I want to summarize the clinic before going deeper into its mono philosophy. Uh, our clinic allows patients to receive an individualized care plan, and that's based on their needs. And some of the main clinic services, and I'll say just main clinic services, I won't list all of them. They include screening for the return of tumors and possible secondary cancers, it includes monitoring short and long-term side effects of cancer treatment. It includes supporting a healthy lifestyle. So that can include advice uh, on diet, exercise, and the correct psychosocial approach for the future of the cancer journey. It includes addressing psychosocial issues. That can be anything from anxiety, depression, insomnia, uh, fear of the cancer returning. 
And we also provide referral to community programs for additional support. And beyond that, the team at our clinic also provides patients and their families with the information to help them manage their own well-being. And I say patients and families, that's a point that uh, we'll talk about uh, in, team, in terms of the uh, interdisciplinary roles. So with that being said, I'd like to show you how we achieve these goals through our clinic model and our clinic philosophy. So the overarching model of our clinic can really be, be described by the bow tie model of 21st century care. And I have a picture of the two bow ties here on the slides. And so I do wanna give credit. These models were first proposed by Dr. Pippa Hawley at the uh, University of British Columbia. And what you'll see in this bow tie model and both of them, you see two triangles overlapping and the blue one is on the left representing disease management and the red one is on the right and that represents palliative care. And in both the disease management and palliative care enhanced models, the triangular arrow shape that really symbolizes the dynamic aspects of disease management and palliative care. And the points in the arrows, that indicates the gradual shift in focus should it be needed. And if I can direct your attention specifically uh, to the palliative uh, enhanced care triangle, that you can see that um, there are two labels on either corner of that triangle. It says, survivorship and bereavement. Uh, before I go further, I do want to clarify that in this context, and in really all contexts of palliative care, uh, it does not necessarily mean that a disease is incurable and that death is inevitable. Because a palliative approach to care, as we understand it, simply focuses on comfort and prolonging life. And so therefore, the significance of having that survivorship in this corner, I hope you can see my mouse, I'm pointing to it here. Um, we understand survivorship to be an outcome that results from rehabilitation. And the dynamic path that this bow tie model represents that leads to survivorship is where our clinic is situated. And so with that high level philosophy in mind, I want to describe how our clinic functions. So it really, it can actually be quite simply uh, demonstrated by the diagram here. It seems like quite a simple diagram, but I have much to say about this. We want to start at the first step. We have the referral of the patient. So they're introduced to the clinic. Uh, baseline consultation is conducted. And so details uh, such as their distress thermometer, which I'll just be calling uh, the DT from here on, uh, as well as the Edmondson Symptom Assessment Scale or ESAS and Canadian Problem Checklist or CPC. So that baseline consultation is where these measures are taken. And in addition, patient concerns are also discussed. The physician at the clinic also examines the patient to assess disease status and complications following anti-cancer treatment, as well as the need for social worker intervention. And the goal of this is to support survivors and help them build their lives after cancer. Recommendations or, or treatments, if you want to call that, such as exercise or nutrition programs, you know, mindfulness-based meditation, stress reduction, you know, and even others, they're all examples of how we achieve that. And so on follow-up visits, we continue to have patients complete the DT, ESAS, CPC questionnaires, we continue to have a physician uh, examine the patient so we can continue to initiate positive changes in patients' lives. And because we understand it's dynamic, and that's why we keep on having uh, these follow-up visits. And so as the patient integrates back uh, to the community, we have a partnership with a community clinic, which I'll go in detail to very soon, uh, that support the patient with a variety of activities and programs, many of which include the recommendations we give to certain patients. So such, and I can just give a few examples now. You know, they offer art therapy, cancer support group activities, meditation, exercise, counseling. You know, they can even be things such as cooking or, or knitting and really much more. And at the same time, the patients continue to be monitored by their family physician. And so in that sense, the clinic opens a channel of communication with the family physician so that they're informed of what to specifically look for and the patients for effective monitoring. And so in fact, we found that one of the most important aspects of this whole process and its success is educating the family physician. Uh, 
But through all of this process, what you'll actually notice is kind of the center of the diagram, there's these words addressing unique patient needs. And what this conveys is that really through all of these uh, experiences at the survivorship clinic, at each step, the unique needs of a patient is always prioritized. And in each step, you can see how an individualized approach is always taken. So this once again speaks to the importance of effectively addressing a patient's concern through the collaboration of an interdisciplinary team. And so you may be asking, what does this interdisciplinary team look like? Look like? And this next slide shows exactly that. This is what an interdisciplinary team looks like, comprised of nurses, physicians, and social workers, other support workers. And I want to go through some of these roles uh, one by one. And I want to start with the role of nurses. So they meet with patients after their referral from oncology to collect the initial baseline assessment forms. And I just talked about them, you know, the DT, the ESAS, uh, the CPC. In addition to that, it's also the responsibility of the nurse to describe to the patient how the clinic functions, right? Its goals, how it can benefit the patient. And on subsequent visits, so those follow-up visits, nurses, they continue to be responsible for collecting assessment forms, vital signs, uh, but at the same time, they're involved in having discussions with patients about their concerns and issues. And some of those discussions or concerns will continue on with the patient's experience with the physicians. And so the nurse, therefore, has this critical role because they really are the first person that a patient sees at the clinic and the last person that the patient sees before leaving the clinic. Uh, and really, as well as the person between the physician and the patient. So they really have to uphold any responsibilities in all those capacities, uh, should it be needed. And if we move on to the role of physicians, we see that they approach the patients after the nurse's initial assessment. And, you know, after, um, pre as I previously mentioned, they're involved in the screening of disease recurrence, comorbid conditions, secondary uh, malignancies. And it's also the physician's responsibility to review the assessment form, such as the distress thermometer, uh, ESA, CPC, that the patient completes. And they use that as a benchmark to discuss these specific issues to the patient and what can be done to help the patient. So at times, the physicians may also be reviewing medication lists or writing referrals, and those referrals can be made to other specialties as well, such as surgery or radiation therapy. And finally, for social workers, they interact with patients who are really showing that distress. And you know, that can happen for a lot of reasons. And there can be a lot of signs of distress. That can be depression, it can be anxiety, it can be suicidal thoughts. It can be having difficulty adjusting to life post-treatment. Uh, but I'm only just giving you a few examples for why patients maybe refer to social workers. And as we've seen earlier, in many survivorship outcomes that stakeholders find most important, many of them refer to challenges outside of the physical illness itself. So we're talking about the psychosocial, the economic, the informational concerns uh, in particular. And so therefore the social worker has that wide range of responsibilities uh, that just like the other roles, we can't just simply list them, right? But it's really represented as a role that uh, it's quite dynamic. But if I were to list some examples, you know, however, these responsibilities they can include providing uh, patients with information about housing and available government financial assistance. Uh, in situations where it's required, they might also be involved in safety planning, community referrals for domestic violence. As well, they can provide access to substance use resources. And there's really a, a wide range of other common topics uh, for discussion. And so, of course, that can include financial issues, family problems, emotional problems, anxiety and self-harm concerns, sexual issues, legal concerns, you know, really the list goes on. We can talk about spirituality, faith, and religion. Um, but another very important aspect of the social worker is that they don't just help the patients. I talked about this, I mentioned it a bit earlier, but we also care very much for their caregivers because they are just as important in the survivorship process. So information such as what resources or supports are available for these caregivers are also provided. But the team effort doesn't just stop there. So it's not just the people within the clinic that contribute to a patient's care, but the patient's community as well. And in between visits to the clinic and living in the community requires support programs in that space which is why 
our survivorship clinic, we partner with a community clinic called Wellspring. And this clinic offers our patients free support programs that are critical to their survivorship journey. You might have recalled earlier uh, that I mentioned this clinic as providing programs such as art therapy, exercise, counseling, support group conversations, you know, even cooking or knitting. Uh, that's all crucial to ensure that patients have access to the recommendations and treatments we provide. And once again, I want to emphasize that word, it's access. Because our clinic, they, it, we can't achieve our target outcomes uh, if all we did were just to simply give patients with ideas, options, and what you should do, what you can do, but no access, right? So it's only through this two-way relationship that survivorship and community clinic, uh, that our survivorship and community clinics can really realize the potential benefit. Uh, and so I want to say that this potential benefit is therefore with this partnership realized. And speaking about these realized benefits, I'd like to begin with actually showing you uh, with the data that we have on our clinic. But I don't just want to show you our updated results today. I want to build a, a story and show you from where we started to where we are now. And so where we started was, well, the initial report we made was on preliminary data. Uh, this was published in 2019, supported care in cancer. This only involved 176 patients who were enrolled in our clinic. And that was between its inception in February of 2017 until the May of 2018. So in this study, we conducted a systematic chart review of these 176 patients who've all completed the baseline and at least one follow-up visit to the clinic. And going into detail about these findings, here we go. So we saw that the average distress score is reported by the distress amount. It's significantly decreased in our patient population from 3.3 to 2.9, and especially decreased in our high-risk uh, patients with initial based on distress score of equal to or greater than four. And so in these high risk patients, their distress score decreased from 5.5 to 4.2. And closely linked to the distress thermometer is the Canadian problem checklist, which helps us to really understand the major problems involved in this distress. So what we found in this preliminary report uh, was that the top five problems were pain, nervousness and anxiety, fatigue, tingling hands and feet, as well as sleep and insomnia. And if we move on to the ESAS on the right, uh, so we saw significant symptom severity reductions in pain, tiredness, nausea, depression, anxiety, drowsiness, and shortness of breath. Uh, what we saw was decreases in nausea and depression having the greatest magnitude of decrease. So that was our first report. Now we conducted another analysis of our clinic in late 2019, this time incorporating uh, all the data we had until the December of that year. And I actually, you know, these results were actually presented to the consortium in, I believe in 2019. I mentioned at the beginning of our presentation. So some of you might actually be familiar with the data on the slide. So I won't spend too much time on it, but to summarize, the updated report had generally similar findings, but you know, there were some key differences. Uh, for example, the distress score did not seem to decrease significantly among all patients, but it did decrease by two points for these high-risk patients, right? You see over here. When we assess the ESAS again, you can see on the chart on the right, significant decreases were seen in tiredness, nausea, depression, and anxiety. And that differs a bit from our first preliminary report um, because pain, drowsiness, and shortness of breath did not have any significant decreases. And finally, the top five problems reported by patients remained the same, though the order was slightly different. So I'm sure now most of you are eager to hear about you know, our even more updated results. But before I share them with you, I really just want to address why there has been such a great emphasis in our past results. And you'll see in our current results as well uh, on measuring and understanding distress. And uh, the reason for that is what I want to talk about here. So in the survivorship setting where challenges from an area, all areas of a patient's life intersect, it can be said really that one of the most critical and significant outcome, outcomes is distress. And since 2009, uh, distress has been referred to as the sixth vital sign in cancer care, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, uh, and the uh, National Comprehensive Cancer Network, so NCCN, it describes it as a multifactorial unpleasant emotional experience of a psychological and cognitive behavior, uh, emotional, social, and or spiritual nature that may interfere with the ability to cope effectively with cancer, its physical symptoms, and its treatment. 
And so in realizing that distress is multifactorial and can inhibit the ability to cope with cancer, you see that definition precisely, you know, it demonstrates this precisely antagonistic force to survivorship. So that's why it's, it's critical for us to understand and measure distress in our survivorship clinic. And before I move on, I really want to symbolize, you know, this perspective on distress uh, with the painting here. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this painting. It's called The Scream. Uh, that was uh, drawn by the famous uh, Norwegian artist Edward Munch. And it represents, I believe, this definition of distress quite well. So Munch, the artist, who just himself described the piece was intended to express his emotions at a time of existential crisis. That was interpreted as a product of a multitude of traumatic experiences in his life. That's analogous to the multifactorial nature of distress. And this was all represented, as you can see in the image, quite an abstract figure. And that symbolizes quite well the challenges in interpreting and measuring distress. And it's, it's not just our perspective, but it's quite a well understood idea. And that's why all Canadian cancer programs, they're required to screen for distress. And it's significant, it's really justified by a multitude of studies. And uh, they show the prevalence of significant distress. So not just any degree of distress, but significant distress. It can, it can hover around maybe 50% of patients with cancer. But of course, um, in other research, it's also been observed to hover lower, say at 35% or even higher at 60%. And so that's why it's absolutely crucial to implement effective ways to assess distress. Because only through those effective means does it provide clinicians the opportunity to understand what is specifically causing that distress. Only that allows us to refer the patient to the appropriate professionals. And speaking on that, this is all dependent on having a uh, effective and reliable ways to assess stress. And unfortunately, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, this has been an area of challenge for clinicians. So despite the significance of assessing distress, there currently isn't one gold standard or one proven way to do it. But in Canada, there have been recommendations by groups or Societies. And the one that I'm going to highlight today is that of the uh, Canadian Cancer Training Action Group. And so they developed a minimum data set to standardize screening. And that included the ESAS, the uh, CPC, the Canadian Problem Checklist, and, and included these two tools as the minimum data set. And I want to emphasize that word. It's important to note that these were the recommendations for minimum standards. They specifically made a call to incorporate additional items based on the specific needs of each jurisdiction. And so with that in mind, at our clinic, we also included the distress thermometer as part of our standard of practice. And really, it's all, it often accompanies the Canadian problem checklist as well. And it's really only with these understandings that we continue with our analysis of the Oster Survivorship Clinic. And so with our updated results today, I want to talk about the, the design very briefly. Um, our study on the updated results of the clinic includes every patient from February of 2017 to June of 2022. So single center, we have a retrospective chart review. And just want to highlight you know, from where we came from to where we are now. We started with 176 patients in our first paper, and now we're moving on to 1,475 patients. And these are the patients who have or continue to receive care through our clinic. And so as with our past reports, the main outcomes that we measure uh, or that we examine are the distress thermometer, the ESAS, and the CPC. But I would also like to note that this chart review is still ongoing and our, our study is not yet completed. We're looking at the data and we're very excited about it. So, so that's why you know, today we're just gonna show you all the information that we have uh, that's available. And so we'll first begin by taking a, a very high level overview of, of the clinic. And I don't want you to get uh, too fucked up by all these uh, numbers. I pulled through some of the very important ones. And so this is, again, from its inception in 2017, you can see all the way until June of 2022. Um, so you can see the number of our total survivorship visits uh, over here. So it really has increased year to year, actually. And we've already totaled uh, over 150 visits as of the, uh, the June of this year. So we're on track to surpass the number of visits from last year. And so in total, you see that we just crossed our 5,000 visit mark. 
And so when we take a look at the number of patients who visit our clinic, again, we see continuous growth year after year. And especially this year, we're you know, just up to June alone, we're very closely approaching the number of patients that uh, we had just the, the previous year. Uh, I do wanna note that uh, a visiting patient from one year counts as a patient again in other years. So for, for example, the patient visited the clinic in 2018, that same patient will count as a visiting patient again if they come in 2019 and 2020. So that's why you see um, up a red asterisk here um, in uh, 1,475, because this just represents the total number of unique patients that have ever visited the, the clinic. So that's why if you add these stuff, by, it won't actually add up to this number. Uh, but with this value, we see that the average number of visits per patient is 3.4, as of now. And with respect to the uh, number of distress thermometer and ESAS assessments we've completed, you can see how the numbers are, are broken down year by year. There really has been general growth year after year until, of course, uh, 2019, 2020. That's when uh, COVID-19 hit. But we actually have many lessons learned that I'll be talking about after this slide. Uh, accompanying this is the compliance rates of DT and ESS assessments. So you know, what percentage of patients coming to our clinic actually complete these assessments? Now we can compare them in person to virtual visits. We see similar patterns, but I just want to hold on to that for now. I want to go into detail on this on a later slide. And finally, when we examine the number of patients with more than one cancer diagnosis who are visiting our clinic, the numbers have remained relatively constant around the 4 to 5% uh, range of all visiting patients. And elaborating more on the growth of the clinic, I've put on the screen two, chart, two charts that show the new consults, uh, follow-up visits, and total visits and discharges for both the Brampton site, which of course starts from uh, February of 2017 on the left-hand side, and Utopico General. So that opened first, you can see in the 2020 to 2021 uh, fiscal year. So we want to take a look at the Brampton site first. We see that the new consults were new patients, and that's highlighted in blue initially increased since 2017. It started declining in 2019, though it, it has been slowly growing since then. Uh, but remember, this does not mean that the number of patients that the clinic is seeing has decreased, uh, which we saw in the previous that was increased. This only shows that new, new patients are uh, being referred to the clinic. And one possible reason for this is simply that when the clinic first opened, you, know, you would expect a surge of patients referred uh, who would all be designated as new patients, right? But of course, as the years progress, the surge would be gone. Uh, returning patients, although they contribute to the overall growth of the clinic, they're not registered as unique patients. Um, and of course, you can also see that demonstrated in the number of follow-up visits uh, at Brampton that's outlined in orange. Again, growth year by year. And in the Etobicoke site, although it's still quite young, we do see uh, some of those similar trends. And when we examine the clinic more in terms of the diagnosis of our patients, we see that the overwhelming majority of patients uh, are those with breast cancer. And that accounts for nearly 70% of all patients. And that's followed by patients with gastrointestinal cancer, comprises about 23% of all patients you see. But assessing these patients, uh, these two diagnoses, they essentially make up the largest stake of the diagnoses of that clinic. You can see that even the third, fourth, fifth and so on most common diagnosis, they don't really even, they don't come close in terms of the percent representation. So cancers such as hematological, genital urinary, lung or skin, gynecological, sarcoma, CNS and others, altogether they only comprise 8% of the patients we see. And as I mentioned a few slides ago, we've also recently taken a particular interest in understanding patients in our clinic who have more than one cancer diagnosis. And, and we might be asking why, and that's because we believe they represent a population with especially unique needs because they have heightened fears, emotions, and thoughts such as self-blame. So again, I've, I've mentioned that our clinic has uh, about 4 to 5% of patients we see as patients with more than one diagnosis. And you can really visualize that on the graph here on the left. And another way that you can look at our clinic is through the number of visits we have according to patient diagnosis. And really the numbers are relatively similar to the distribution of um, patient diagnosis overall. So we have patients with lung cancer uh, visit, to, sorry, patients with uh, breast cancer visit to our clinic far more than any other diagnosis followed by patients with uh, GI cancers. And so what this really shows is, is that uh, a particular diagnosis is not necessarily linked to more or less visits. So um, we haven't really looked at that data too much just as of now. And another interesting observation for us um, was that the, you know, that was unique to 
the period that we examined this data up to June 2022 was we can look at the impact of COVID-19. One way that I want to show this is through the types of visits we had. You can see from 2017 to 2019, all of our visits were in person. But starting in 2020, the majority of pay, uh, visits, they became virtual. You can see that uh, in red on the graph on the right. And it's really remained this way since, even up to this year. And so the overall visits, though, they haven't decreased. And that can be due to many factors. Uh, potentially such as a timely and effective transition effort by our, our team, um, or as well as patient initiative. But in all cases, the sudden increase in virtual or phone visits, it gave us opportunities to really ask important questions. And some of these most important questions are, number one, are these virtual clinics as effective as in-person clinics? Number two, can this increase the accessibility and efficiency of our clinic without compromising quality? And number three, if we are to sustain this because of patient preference, how can we create a clinic that offers this hybrid model? So these are some very critical research questions that we aim to address moving forward. But unfortunately, we've also observed that the COVID experience uh, resulted in a drastic reduction of the patient completion or compliance rates of the ESAS and distress thermometer forms. And these rates, they've generally been really great. They've been above 90% 90, 90%, you can see here up to 2019 before COVID, but really dropped drastically starting in 2020, um, although the numbers are starting to recover, you can see. Um, but an interesting point is that when we separate the compliance rate of ESAS assessments between in-person uh, and virtual visits, you, we can actually see that the decrease for in-person ESAS compliance only hit 68% at its lowest point in 2020. And it's actually seemed up to this year's recovery, back up to 92.4%. Um, but virtual visits have always continued uh, to be completed at a very low compliance rate, as you can see here at the last row. And so it appears that virtual visits is really where lacking the capture of total assessments. And this shows that overall, uh, the decreased compliance rate, aside from being attributed, of course, to understaffing and transition challenges we had during COVID, can also be explained by the difficulties in completing the assessment forms virtually. And that's a point that we're going to look into moving forward as well. But uh, regardless what the uh, assessment forms were able to collect, when we present to you the updated results of our survivorship clinic outcomes in terms of the distress thermometer and Canadian problem checklist and ESAS. So we'll begin with the, uh, the distress thermometer and the Canadian problem checklist. Uh, I'm sure most of you are, are familiar with this. So I won't go uh, too much in a uh, description with this, but I just wanna say that the distress thermometer often accompanies the Canadian problem checklist, um, which is a well, item of 21 um, or 21 items you can see that represent the most commonly reported problems in patients with cancer because it helps us attribute distress to some possible causes. So what we found in total, uh, we were able to retrieve a bit over 2,300 distress to monger assessments and the average compliance score was just under 50%. Again, most of that due to the COVID-19 period. And what we found from patients with baseline distress uh, DT to their first follow-up was a significant reduction in distress score First of all, for all popular of all patients as a whole, but like we've seen in our previous analyses, especially a decrease in those higher risk patients from 6.3 to 4.5. And when we take a look at the uh, that consistency, uh, it also exists with our analysis of the Canadian problem checklist: pain, nervousness, and anxiety, fatigue, tingling hands and feet, and sleep or insomnia. It continues to be the top five reported problems by patients. But this time, I actually want to also point out, it might be worthwhile to know the problems that are actually least common. And so you can see that at the very bottom of the, um, the, the last five rows of the right-hand side. And so those least common problems include lack of information about diagnosis and treatment, other unlisted problems, mouth sore, swallowing, uh, talking, and loss of faith. Generally, and I say generally, we see that lack of information has not been actually a, too common of a problem among our patients, which you can see from here. And next up, I'd like to share the results, the updated results of our ESAS assessments. Again, I'm sure many of you, if not all of you are familiar with this tool. So very briefly, uh, self-report tool that measures the severity of the symptoms you see here on the screen. So zero corresponds to no issue and 10 was, was, uh, corresponds to the worst issue with that symptom. At a high 
high level overview glance, we retrieved a total of just a, over 2100 ESAS documents. It has a slightly lower compliance rate than the distress thermometer, just at 42.3%. Um, on the screen, you can see the average and median scores for each uh, symptom. Of course, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of these, but generally you can see that difficulties in tiredness and well-being, they are reported on average as the worst experienced symptoms and nausea as the least. And so when we examine changes in mean ESAS scores between our patients as baseline and follow-up visits, we found a decrease in the raw and the raw average severity of all symptoms, but we only saw statistical significance in the reduction of tiredness, nausea, depression, anxiety, and drowsiness, which once again, it aligns with our past results. But I, I really wanna go beyond this for a second because it's really to just go beyond these numbers and statistics. And I wanna talk about the, the change in terms of magnitude. So you, we can tell that even the greatest change was in tiredness, depression, anxiety. Uh, which only decreased by 0 0.3 points. And the lowest statistically significant change was that of nausea, you see over here. That was just a decrease of 0 0.1 points. So we can already have some, you know, we raised some questions about its clinical significance. Uh, but we, what we are noticing is that the average ESAS scores for all symptoms tend to be on the lower end, right? It's not up at the higher end, like seven or eight. And so what that shows to us and what we hope to do then similar as to what we did with the distress thermometer is to evaluate those high risk patients with an initial severity at a, a particular threshold in the ESAS and then evaluate their change that follow up. So that gives us a stratified illustration uh, of what may have a more pronounced change. And so with these updated results of our clinic, we've been able to observe that We've been uh, that we've grown uh, in the number of patients we see and the number of visits we get, even in the face of the pandemic, which although has of course significantly lowered our overall assessment compliance rates, mostly due to virtual visits, it did allow us to gain insights on the feasibility and possible benefits of offering a virtual component to our clinic, which of course will be researching moving forward. What has remained consistent is that our clinic continues to see patients with predominantly uh, breast or GI cancers. And this is something we want to be mindful of in particular as we continue with their research, because as I've mentioned many times, survivorship is about tailoring care to an individual's specific needs. And we all know that patients with different cancers have different needs. So our updated, resu updated results have also generally concurred with our past results, especially in terms of the DT findings for high-risk patients and the top five reported problems on the CPC, which has really remained consistent throughout. And although there were significant ESAS symptom severity reductions and just in tiredness, nausea, depression, and anxiety, the small magnitude of change really shows and indicates to us that we may find more pronounced effects if we were to stratify the patients, for example, by initial symptom severity. Uh, before I end off with some of our next steps and implications, I wanna mention that some months ago, some months ago Dr. Erkuhart and colleagues delivered a wonderful presentation here on sustainability. And in light of our continued results and analyses, it really inspired us to recognize the importance of sustainability. Because quite simply, if we don't develop ways to recognize the importance of sustainability, uh, then we would have wasted time, we would have wasted money, resources, and most of all, we would have not allowed our patients to receive the best care possible. And so studies have shown that self-report uh, measures indicate up to 60% of programs sustained, or at least in part, uh, but studies with more objective measures have found lower rates of sustainability. Uh, so although the barriers and facilitators of program sustainability vary greatly depending on, say, the type of program, the setting, the target population, a multitude of other factors and variables, some general ones that I've listed, uh, I've listed here on the slide. So for example, some general barriers that can include limited staff training and knowledge, workload pressures, lack of support and staff shortages. There's also some general facilitators here. For example, adequate training, staff accountability and support and adaptability. Specifically at our survivorship clinic, we take it very seriously. And we have a wonderful team of performance consultants who make that happen. And in particular, I wanna mention Jennifer. Um, she's an organizational performance consultant at Oster. And she's been able to make so much data with the clinical understandable for us. 
And it really helps us understand what changes, logistical or otherwise, that can be made to the clinic to best support the unique needs um, at any given time. And so in conclusion, the survivorship clinic at Oster is designed to empower patients through addressing unique patient needs uh, with all types of support that they need to live happy and fulfilling lives. And although we've grown significantly, we'll always continue to be a growing clinic with research helping guide us with the changes we can make to better serve our patients. And although the COVID-19 pandemic has given us unprecedented challenges, we've also taken from it unprecedented opportunities, in particular, the use of virtual clinic visits. And the, through today's updated results of our clinic, we've been very happy to report significant decreases in the data of our patients. But it's always more important for us to find ways to report differences in the lives of our patients. So therefore, measuring the clinical significance of our data continues to be an area of work ahead. And in all cases, understanding and measuring sustainability will continue to be a crucial part of the growth of our clinic. It's helped us continuously move in a forward and positive direction. And it's something that once again, all initiatives should implement to some extent. And finally, I also wanna end off by saying that clinics like ours and other interventions likewise, we may be susceptible to separating those from clinical work with those from research. And even though not everybody needs to have an intense role in research, it's important for the appreciation and sustainability of an intervention to involve all staff, at least to some extent, in understanding what they contribute to and the critical evaluation of what it is they contribute to. And its importance is in achieving that goal, which is shared by so many, like that of our own clinic, which is to provide support and hope for patients. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for attending our presentation and I'd be very happy to answer any questions along with Dr. Chasen.